Hello class, this is going to be the midterm number two review lecture. The next video is going to be the actual lecture itself on exploit development and getting into return oriented programming. We're going to go over um, a review of exploit development concepts you will need to know, network hacking concepts, network security concepts, web application hacking and security concepts, and lastly the big picture and then what to expect from the midterm, which is going to be similar to the first one. Reverse engineering actually will not be tested on the midterm. Um, I feel that I adequately assess the reverse engineering concepts through the homework and through the other challenges in the class. Um, but for exploit development, you're going to have to know the basics of how a stack overflow, uh, buffer overflow works in Linux. Um, without ASLR, without depth by on just you know the very basic vanilla system with no security, how a buffer overflow would work and how you would exploit it, you have to know this. You have to know with format strings how you leak memory, uh, how you reveal the contents of memory on the stack, how you reveal the contents of memory at a specific memory address, how you would, as in uh, the latest homework that was due, how you would write arbitrary values to specific locations with a memory string uh, or the format string vulnerability, and how this would be used to overwrite things like function pointers so that when they get called they can point to your shellcode instead. Um, and so the global offset table is one really good example in Linux how to achieve that. Oops, you're going to have to know heap overflows and how, uh, in general, uh, with the DL malloc unlinking algorithm, you can achieve arbitrary writes. Um, and lastly, in this arena, you're going to have to know how security mitigations came about to combat each of these techniques. For instance, the basic stack overflows, eventually data execution prevention, and NX came about um, to prevent having executable data wherever uh, user input is supposed to be. In, in other words, NX and DEP enacted a policy saying that if it's writable, it's not supposed to be executable. And so that mitigates a lot of code a lot of exploits that rely on injecting malicious code into the, vi the victim process space. Um, then heap allocators got smarter um, and uh, implemented better algorithms such as safer unlink algorithms, better uh, allocator algorithms that are a little more random and harder to predict. And this, this combated many of the generic heap overflow techniques um, and prevented what many arbitrary write uh, enabling heap vulnerabilities uh, provided. You're going to have to know um, how attackers relied on things being located fixed addresses on, for instance, the stack and maybe the heap um, and perhaps also you know, the headers of the file uh, and the global offset table and how that changed with address space layout randomization. Um, ASLR, if you remember, uh, simply randomizes the base address for each memory segment. It doesn't scramble the insides of a memory segment. It just makes it load in at a different location every time. This is a feature provided by the operating system. And so this mitigated many attacks and attack techniques. Um, that rely on any form of fixed address to perform the exploit or land the exploit. Um, and the way to attackers defeat ASLR is by using, um, in, in combination with their target vulnerability, whether it's a stack overflow or a heap vulnerability or a format string vulnerability, they're also going to have to leverage a memory leak or a memory address leak vulnerability and we'll be talking about that perhaps t uh, next time's lecture um, but you're not going to need to know how to do that on the exam 
So, going over a brief history that we haven't done so for uh, yet, um, most of these uh, security mitigations or executable executable mitigations um, were actually pioneered by Windows and Microsoft. And in Service Pack 2 of Windows XP, um, they started using universally stack cookies, a better uh, unlinking algorithm, um, a weak form of ASLR that only did the PEB and the TEB, um, and they implemented DEP, which you know non-executable heap and stack. Um, <clears throat> that same uh, year, just about uh, a little later. Linux, specifically Red Hat Enterprise, implemented NX, which is the Linux analog for DEB, Data Execution Prevention, and uh, weak ASLR, just for libraries and dynamically linked libraries, that's it. So they didn't have a safe run linking algorithm or stack cookies by default. So this is a really good chart from the people at Trail of Bits. Um, illustrating the progression of uh, exploit mitigations from Windows XP to 2008. Um, you're not going to have Windows 7 and then EMET, the Enhanced Mitigation Experience Toolkit, uh, being covered on this chart. Um, but you can see that in the very beginning they had weak ASLR, they had uh, something called weak depth, they didn't have permanent depth, and we'll get into that in a little bit later in this class. Um, <clears throat> they did implement safe unlinking, they did implement safe stack cookies, uh, they had SEH handler validation, you don't need to know SEH for this time, um, actually you don't need to know it for this class. We covered it last year and I don't feel like it's a viable attack vector anymore because it's been adequately solved, which is a good story in the, you know, in the world of security. Um, and so on. So, um, the way stack cookies work are that critical pointers on the stack and maybe other places are padded with a cookie that's stored somewhere in the process space. And on certain uh, instructions, these the neighboring cookies are checked. And so whenever red is called, the cookie right before it, right before the return address on the stack is, is checked to see if it's been overwritten. If it's been overwritten, it's SIG aborts uh, to prevent EIP from being hijacked. Um, also checking metadata on the heap allows uh, the process to detect whether or not the heap has been corrupted, perhaps in a buffer or flow. Um, and <clears throat> being, from an attacker standpoint, detecting uh, DEP, ASLR is tricky. If you have local access to the machine, you can run the process that you're trying to attack. Maybe you're trying to do a privesque, that's a, decent enough scenario. If you can run it, if you run it twice and you check the locations of the memory segments, which would be in proc slash the process ID of the given process slash, I believe, maps, um, that would show the map of the memory segments. If the memory segment map differs between executions, that means the locations for the, the base addresses of each segment are being randomized, hence ASLR. DEP can be checked, or NX can be checked, if, similarly if you have local access, um, by checking, again, the map, it will show the permissions, the read, write, execute, etc., for each memory segment. If it has ex if it has write, but not execute, DEP will probably be on. Um, it is, in Linux, there's a, a utility called stack exec which you run this utility you pass it a given application or binary it's going to tell you if the stack is set to be executable that is 
usually in all implementations of NX, the first thing that's protected, but just because the stack may be executable, there may be a weak form of NX and the heap may be executable and writable, but the stack may be protected. So that may still be uh, vulnerable to attack. Um, as for detecting these things remotely, mm, ASLR is going to be difficult as well as depth, and it, it's usually something that's indicated by the uh, fingerprinting that you do remotely of the operating system and perhaps the, the version of the target application as well. As usually as we saw that certain operating systems have these mitigations on by default, so if you can detect that it's Windows Vista, as opposed to Windows XP, you have a better idea of what you're going to have to go up against as an attacker. <clears throat> so, this is a pretty decent uh, Venn diagram. Um, ignore the SEH stuff of the big, big bold items indicate what part of a, a desktop computer handles what mitigations. And so the ones we're interested in here are NX and DEP, um, ASLR, code signing checks, um, and stack cookies. And that uh, there are two forms of DEP, um, but the strongest one is supported by hardware, and it's effectively uh, architectures that support the, the Harvard architecture bit that dictates whether or not this is instructions or data. Um, so that divides the process space and this this NX bit is something that's going to be supported in hardware if it exists and hardware assisted DEP is basically NX or DEP that uses the NX bit um, to allow the operating system to make the determinations when uh, it should abort a process if it starts uh, performing a legal operation on protected memory segment. Um, such as jumping to it to start launching a shellcode or trying to write to uh, protected memory. Um, although that's typically just going to be a segfault. Um, ASLR is an operating system layer security mechanism that when a process is exact or uh, started, when it's all being set up, the memory segments are loaded in or mapped and that's where the, the locations become randomized and that's handled by the operating system. Stack cookies and the code that's put into a process for checking them is all handled by the linker and the compiler. Code signing checks are usually a combination of the hardware and operating system working together to determine whether or not um, a, a update from Microsoft or update from Google or this or that or a driver update uh, has the proper uh, s signatures, is valid, comes from the uh, proper source, and uh, is thus trusted by your hardware and operating system. So, even though your platform may support all these things, it is very important to note that many of them may be off by default. In fact, if you tamper with your device, such as phones and tablets and mobile devices, if you jailbreak them, usually you have to disable code signing ability and NX bit. And so that disables a whole slew of, uh, of exploit mitigations, with the exception of ASLR, but it makes it much easier to attack. So specifically, for the exam, you're going to have to know what depth an NX is and how it mitigates certain attacks. And likewise, you're going to have to know what ASLR is and how it mitigates certain attacks. So, as I said, um, many of these features may be off by default. So, uh, when it's not on ma by uh, mandate of the operating system, um, Applications such as uh, uh, Linux, Windows, etc., we're going to have to opt into it. And one way that that is is to compile things with the NX compat flag. Um, I 
forget what compiler that is for. I believe it's Microsoft Visual C++. I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that. Um, and as I said, uh, there can be weak implementations for each of these things. Um, partial address space layout randomization means that the base locations for only certain memory segments are randomized each time the process is initialized. And that some things will always be static. Full ASR means that nothing is going to be loaded in a static location, and the base location for every memory segment is going to be randomized each time the process is, is initialized. Stack cookies, as I said, they're stored somewhere in the process space, and that's typically in the dot data segment. If you can debug the program or somehow read the process space, you can read the cookie. Um, however, on a 32-bit system, the cookie can usually be brute force, and the cookie is the algorithm to choose it is usually well known and there may be biases in the algorithm to allow you to brute force it smarter. And let's we'll see, for exploit development wrapping up, you're going to have to know the very basics of shell code. You have to know how null bytes cause a problem, especially in buffer overflows. You have to know how system calls are made. Um, and you're going to have to know the topics just conceptually covered at the end of, through the end of today's lecture, um, but you don't have to know for the exam the topics covered by our guest lecturer next Monday. So, but you are going to have to know return to library style techniques, return chaining, and ROP, which we are all covering this lecture. As for internet and network hacking, um, there are tons of different protocols and uh, applications, you might say, out there at the various layers. I've highlighted the ones that we're going to focus on and also put them just on separate slides themselves. So I've tried to narrow it down to a s much smaller scope of what you might be expected to see. Um, so DNS, HTTP, remember HTTP is stateless and how it handles cookies and stuff like that and TLS and SSL and how it enables HTTPS and everything else that relies on SSL and TLS. The transport layer protocols, TCP, UDP, um, you don't have to master the state machine at all uh, for TCP. Um, you have to know basics of IP, the link layer, how addresses are resolved to their lower layer uh, address. Um, you have to know about the ARP cache, and I've covered it briefly, may not have called it the ARP cache, but the way ARP works is that it caches any responses to uh, any ARP responses it sees, regardless of whether or not there was an ARP request in the first place. And so by just Spamming the network with spoofed ARP, ARP responses, um, you can flood the cache for a target, uh, and then when that target goes to talk to that IP address, it will talk to you instead if you do it right, and that enables man to middle attacks. You're going to have to know um, defenses and routing mechanisms, how NAT protects a lot of users, um, prevents attackers from being able to directly address them and what that means for certain exploit techniques like port binding shellcode. Um, you're going to know just like the very basics of the firewall and you know how they block traffic by incoming ports um, rather than the destination port if it's incoming traffic. Um, and IP address. Intrusion detection systems, prevention systems, web application firewalls, we covered that last time. Um, you have to know uh, stateful firewalls, uh, IP is stateless, UDP is stateless, TCP has a state machine, so it's stateful. Um, you can still check for protocol non-compliance without forming a state machine uh, for many protocols. And so you can still do that for stateless protocols. Um, so malformed IP packets, malformed UDP packets are just examples, you know, corrupted headers. Um, there may be vulnerabilities in 
the network stack for a given you know embedded system that you want to protect. So this is just another example of a TCP state uh, model. This one's probably better than the previous one I had in my slides. But it shows in these highlighted, these color-coded highlighted areas, there's groups of states, fin weight one, fin weight two, time weight, etc. And it's pretty simple to understand. You don't have to master it. And you won't be expected to recreate this. And going on, you're gonna have to know about deep pack inspection, how to defeat it. You have to know uh, the attacks that we covered in class on how to defeat it. Um, as for web application hacking, this is where uh, the textbook knowledge will likely be tested. And I've uh, outlined the specific pages that I expect you to focus on. This thing highlighted in yellow, uh, you're definitely going to want to read that and understand it. That's going to come up. And then other things like attacks against admin features and application management features in a web page. Um, often the, the management backend for a web application will not have the same amount of uh, security mechanisms in it as the, the parts that are exposed to most, most users. And so it may be possible to perform a cross-site scripting attack against just the admin uh, say he's on he or she's on the back end reviewing posts or performing administrative functions banning people stuff like that uh, you may be able to pull off cross-site scripting attack um, and there's other things like same origin policy how on the client side your browser prevents you what other web pages from accessing the resources you have stored on your machine that came from a different domain and then the various encoding schemes uh, that are used to communicate data across the World Wide Web. You should probably skim pages 53 through 57 and be aware just of the various server-side technologies from PHP to databases, etc. And you're going to know the basics of SQL injection and cross-site scripting. As for vulnerabilities in general, um, some vulnerabilities are more severe than others, and a way to, um, a metric to communicate the severity of one vulnerability from another uh, involves scoring them based on their access vector, how complex it is to exploit it, whether or not there's any authentication involved, and how many times uh, the attacker may have to authenticate with the target in order to exploit the vulnerability. Um, and the vulnerability's impact on the confidentiality, availability, integrity of the system. So the structure of the midterm is going to be very similar to the first one. It's going to be true false questions based on the concepts. And the majority of the tests will be on testing your understanding of the concepts and about 10 to 20 percent of it is going to be in your ability to apply the concepts. Um, and that is it.